Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone, today we are continuing our conversation with Lynn Faust. Lynn is the author of Fireflies, Glowworms, and Lightning Bugs, Identification and Natural History of the Fireflies of the Eastern and Central United States and Canada. We started this conversation in the last episode, and we'll wrap it up in this episode. If you haven't listened to the first part of our conversation, then I encourage you to go to episode 15 and listen to it. Just as a real quick reminder, we ended last week's episode talking about the larvae of the Paractamina or spring treetop flasher fireflies and how they are so special because they pupate on the sides of the trees where we can see them. And they do this in the late winter or very early spring, basically the late February or early March timeframe in Kentucky and Tennessee. And of course, that's going to change slightly if you are further south or further north. In this episode, we're going to jump right back into that conversation with Lynn describing some of the Paractamina's mating behaviors and then why they might choose to come out so early. So let's pick up where we left off in the last episode. That's just a a very cool species to start with because also the males emerge two weeks before the females, and that's a process called protandry. It means the males become mature before the females. And so in this tree firefly species, the males come out first and they spend the next two weeks searching every nook and cranny of the tree for a female pupa. And if they find one, so obviously they can smell her or sense her somehow. And if they find her, they climb on top of her, put their arms around her, and they never move again until she comes out as a a white female and they will mate her immediately upon eclosion well, she'll still be white oh, wow. and the adaptation is interesting because these are very early season fireflies so they've had to figure out ways to get around the fact that it might snow you might have an ice storm it might be so cold they could never fly they, they don't fly below 50 degrees very well And so these early season fireflies have all sorts of different ways to assure the next generation. So this male guarding, he guards his female, he fights off all comers, is so that he can mate her even if there's never a night suitable or warm enough for flashing or for flight, he will have already mated her once. And uh, most of the females will mate multiple times if given the opportunity and the same holes for the males but I always think that's kind of a miracle because we've had nights some seasons you might only have three nights in late March early April where they could have flown in flash because otherwise it's cold it's windy it's wet but they have that worked out so they they survive anyway yeah I'm gonna have to go start looking because yeah for our listeners we're recording this and mid-February, mid-late February, because right. Lynn's season actually starts and she's going to be out in the field starting next week, possibly. Yes. Um, and yeah. we just had a big snowstorm where I'm at, um, snow, ice, and other uh-huh. parts of the country or parts of the eastern U.S. And so last night we got several inches of snow and this is right. the third storm in like a week and a half, if that long mm-hmm. for us. So we've had a really cold, wintry couple of weeks here. Yeah, it's not normal for this time of the year here. I mean, it's not abnormal, but it's not normal either. Yeah, we're having a real winter this year, sort of. Yeah, first part wasn't, but now the end is crunching it all together. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and so a really good time to look for, and there's also a firefly called a winter firefly. All of these are in my book. Each one has about 10 pictures or more showing you what they look like. The winter firefly actually came out last fall as an adult, they're the exception to every rule of everything. They live nine months and they, they overwinter on trees also as adults. And they have the ability to freeze solid. I've seen them at temperatures, you know, at zero and they can freeze and thaw back out if you don't bother them. So we actually are getting ready to have two species active right now. And the larvae that I was talking about that climb on trees and emerge white and make guard, What they'll start doing as early as December, if you get a warm, sunny day, 
you'll see these larvae will, will come out of the ground. So they're hiding somewhere at the base of the tree, you know, kind of sheltered. And on days where it looks like the sun might be out and they use the radiant heat of the sun, they come up and start looking for spots to pupate. And those are usually the males. They do it before the females. But then if you get weather like you and I had last night, even if they had sort of found a good place on the tree, it's still a little early and they will retreat and go back. They went back to the earth last night mm -hmm. to not be in, somehow they know they're little weather people or something, but they don't get caught, although they have quite an ability also to get very cold. But that's just the early season species. A June species might not have that adaptability and would probably die if it was exposed mm -hmm. to what we're gonna experience tonight. But each, each season of fireflies has their own little tricks they use to survive. It's really amazing. It is. And I mean, listening to talk about these fireflies that are out right now on the sides of the trees, yeah. the question that just keeps popping into my mind is why? Oh. What in the world spurred <laughs> them? How did this evolution happen for them to start going up on the tree? In the winter. And it's way too early to do anything. Stay in the safety and the warmth of the ground. You would think it's, there is a theory. There's a good paper out on that. And for your listeners, I have a lot of scientific papers too that are not nearly as fun to read as my book, but you know, where we have explored and I have written a paper called Fireflies in the Snow about these two winter species with lots of, my papers are always very heavy in pictures because that's what interests me. But we do think the early, both the Alignia, the winter firefly and the Practomena borealis, the uh, spring treetop, are they have chosen coming out earlier and risking quite a lot because as you said the weather does not always cooperate in return for avoiding we think primarily the predatory fireflies that are so abundant in the summer and that's the Futura species it's the females only but they have the ability to flash like every other species to pretend to be every other species and they lure the gullible males in and then they eat them. And they get the defensive chemicals from the other firefly species. They incorporate those chemicals into their eggs, which help their eggs survive. But we do know the winter fireflies are avoiding most of the paractamina. I mean, most of the Faturus predatory ones. In your neck of the woods, because I've been there and done some surveys there, you'll get your very first Faturus will come out in May. And it's the four flashers, the quadrifulgans. I've, I've seen them at Mammoth, I've seen them nearby. And their females are also predatory, but not quite as much as the ones to come a few weeks later. So by then, the winter firefly, Alicnia, and the Paractamina borealis are completely gone by early May. They have done their life season, they have found one another, they have mated, and they have died. So they really have effectively avoided the predators. And yeah, there's other predators too, all the birds looking for food for their babies and the mice for their babies. And fireflies do protect themselves with intense chemicals, these cardiac glycosides. And so a lot of animals actually don't eat them. They're chemically protected, but some do. And so by coming out early, they're avoiding that, but they're risking a lot. So it's all a balance. And they also are avoiding competition with all the fireflies to come. They kind of get a jump on it and get their season over with. And so it is a question because the order of emergence in any one place does not vary each year. The first species out is usually always going to be the first species out. Then it will be followed by a second one and a third one. And then you get to where maybe five at once will come out because you're in the peak of the season. So they also are limiting competition between the other species, between the other larvae, because all those larvae are in the dirt and they've all got to find something to eat. It's so exquisite. You know, just the balance and the interplay. And we, again, understand very little of it, but, but they do at some level. <laughs> they, they keep surviving yeah. despite us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is just fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping when the sun comes out next week, it's supposed to get in the 60s. That's the very best day of all to look for some of the climbing larvae because they will all 
tend to emerge on the first warm, sunny day. Mm -hmm. And so be looking at your big, large diameter trees. Again, if you have my book, I have pictures of it. I've also got scientific papers showing you. And the alichne of the winter firefly, it can work both ways. If you had a really good summer before and the final end stars are big enough, they go ahead and become adults. No one knows how they make that decision, but there comes a point at the end of the summer where each larvae has to decide in a firefly sort of way of making decisions whether it's going to grow larger and stay a larvae until the next year, or will it go ahead and become a smaller adult? Mm -hmm. And so these alignia become adults usually, and they climb their trees in the fall, but there was one year in 2007 here, and I don't know the circumstances, but they did mass emergence the end of February. And I was seeing up to 200 alignia crawling up trees all in one day. And I think this year we have the possibility that that may happen again, because I've, I've not seen many on the trees this fall or this winter. And so they've got to be somewhere. And we've had sort of a nice enough winter that it really was a winter. So they knew it was winter and they didn't come out. So everybody be looking in the next couple of weeks on the sunny, warm days. You, you might see some fireflies on the trees, larvae or adults. Yeah, that, that'll be cool. Yeah. So it's not supposed to get quite so warm up here, but still fit mid fifties. That works because I've also spent a lot of time measuring the sunny sides of trees versus the north side, and it's a profound difference on sunny days. The radiant energy is incredible. And these in insects, they're dark backed. They know to take advantage of that. And they apparently can really absorb the heat. So be looking. Let me know. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Are most of your listeners in the Kentucky area or how would you? Eastern U.S. And this all holds true. Everything I've said holds true. It's just if you are more Southern, it will happen sooner than if you're more Northern. So for instance, I'm expecting this week, I will get from friends in Florida. I have good spotters that contact me every year. A lot of them I know well anyway, but Gainesville, Florida will start having flashing fireflies this week up in the trees. Those same Paractamina borealis. And then it's interesting because the reports start moving north and a month later, they'll be in Atlanta and Jackson, Mississippi. And then, you know, then they'll show up in Tennessee, then they'll move on up. And sometimes it might be June before they're all the way up to New England and Canada. Same species, not the same individuals, but they just move upward. So I do a lot of work with film crews and we have done a good bit of work in the Jackson, Mississippi area. And whatever happens in Jackson, Mississippi will happen about a month later at my house. And so it's all, it's all heat, accumulated heat of the season. I use degree days for prediction. Mm -hmm. So if, if somebody, if your listeners are listening from way up north, you'll get it too, but it will be a few weeks after we have it down in the south. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like with the plant. Yeah. The plants bloom at different times, depending on where you're at. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And my book covers around 70 species. And for the most part, we share many, many of the species. There are a few that are only in the South, a few that are only up North, but in general, and I, I give ranges, you know, in each species chapter, so you can kind of tell if you should have it or not. I did not do range maps and people have criticized me for that. And I'm so glad I didn't because I knew that so little was known of where they actually live. I didn't want someone to glance and see that their state wasn't filled in and they go, oh, well, we don't have that one. That's not true. In fact, we just published a paper last year, a group of us did, and we extended the range of uh, the pink winkers. Isn't that a great name? The, the <laughs> pink is. winkers, yeah, they're called the yellow bellies in the book, but we extended the range by almost a thousand miles all the way across the central part of the US. And this species, it's Photinus scintillans, was considered the species with the smallest range ever. And it was only supposed to be in eastern Pennsylvania. And so we have found it all the way to Missouri now. So I knew with this book, maybe down the road, because I love range maps, I love to be able to glance. Mm -hmm. And maybe later books will have that. But at this time, you got to figure out 
what you have before you start filling in. And it's not like birds where you have thousands of birders that <laughs> keep great records and you totally can recognize them through your binoculars. This is a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So don't write me that you're mad. I don't have range maps, but I do provide where there have been records and you can kind of fill in from that. Yeah. And that makes sense for something like the fire, fireflies here that we don't know enough right. about. I mean, it, it's recognizing we don't know enough. We need more research. Come help yeah. us. Yes. And also they're so habitat specific. They're like wildflowers. Many of them are not all. Some are more generalists, but most of them are extremely habitat specific. Whereas if you stand a hundred yards away in the wrong place or go out 10 minutes too late, you'll miss them and you'll think they aren't there at all. Oh, it's wow. that specific, particularly the ones that live around ponds, cattails, you know, that's it. You're not going to see them anywhere other than that little tiny pond. And there's one that I know is in Western Kentucky. I know it is. And I ran out of time last year. I have a paper on it. It's a new species called the cypress firefly, Photurus waldoxii. And I have found them all along the edge of Western Kentucky. And I've run out of time every time, but I know they're there. They're right across the river, but anywhere you ha still have cypress trees, and I was interested to see how many Cypress areas still exist in far Western Kentucky, but that would be something anyone over that way, they can look and I can tell them what to look for. A very distinctive flash again, which makes it easier to tell a species. A lot of the species are very generic and just a little single pale flash. And it's all a difference of timing, which is also tied to temperature. So the hotter it is, the faster everyone flashes. But those single little bitty dusk active ones are some of the hardest ones to tell apart in the wild, just because they look similar to so many other species. And it was one reason the pink winkers or Photinus scintillans had not been identified in other places, because it kind of looks like a lot of other ones that are common and people had not taken the time to look. Right. Because like we said at the very beginning, everybody just thinks they're all the same thing. They're all the same. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it's what we all started with. It is. You said earlier that the adults, fireflies typically don't eat. Um, the mm -hmm. femme fatales, the predatory ones, they'll eat males of other species. Yeah. They eat like crazy. Yeah. Or the males of their, their own species, possibly. Yes. But I was reading a paper and this was that you had written and mm -hmm. you had mentioned it to me as well about finding fireflies on milkweeds and yeah. after I read that I was like wait a minute I've seen them occasionally on milkweeds and just never really paid them any attention because well I just thought they were sitting there because yeah. well fireflies don't eat as adults but you were finding possibly differences can you tell us about that exactly it was such an exciting thing the thinking always has been well fireflies don't eat as adults yet I in my paper go through numerous um, reports of scientific studies where they saw fireflies on milkweed, but because we all believe, well, fireflies don't eat, we just figured they're sitting on the milkweed, but report after report would sometimes report them as many as 10% of the insects they saw were fireflies on milkweed. And um, in, I guess, 2013, I, I tell it in my paper and I've presented it at international symposiums. I was actually riding horses with someone and crossed the Holston River onto an island we have where our farm is that had lots of wild milkweed. And from the saddle of the horse, and you really can't do much insect work sitting in the saddle, there were so many fireflies on the milkweed, I could see it from my saddle. And it's like, holy cow, what is going on? And I got off and they weren't sitting there in the shade or hanging out because I guess they, you know, fireflies do kind of have to hang out somewhere during the day. They were nectaring. So anyway, the milkweed were covered with fireflies. So I started a study at that point because called several scientists said, listen to what I just saw. And oh, well, no, they don't eat. No, they don't eat. But that began a several year study, which is ongoing. I have a lot more species added to my list now than even when the paper was published. But they definitely are nectaring. And it's something to be aware of for all of your listeners. Pay attention. And since that time, I've got several super talented photographers and naturalists who read the paper also 
and have sent me a number of other pictures of other flowers with fireflies nectaring on the blooms of various different types of flowers. So it does happen. You just have to open your eyes and look. And we know when I keep them in captivity, a firefly who's given a little sliver of an apple slice, just a little sliver, will spend 90% of their time on that apple slice. And, you know, assuming they're kind of getting the sweet juice from it and they're much happier, they'll live longer. You know, they're just a happier firefly if you keep a little apple slice. So it could be they're just nectaring to get the sweet liquid, but it was so preferential to milkweeds. And as you know, milkweeds have the cardiac glycosides in their sap, they actually have it in every part of the flower. And chemically, the protective chemicals in milkweed is almost chemically identical to what fireflies have. And no one has ever known where the fireflies acquired their chemicals to protect themselves. And um, that's always been, oh, well, they get it. It's like, well, how do they get it? Mm -hmm. And so it could be, and there was an ongoing study trying to answer this question after our paper was published by, um, the study was being run by the late Scott Smedley up in Connecticut, who sadly died way too young. He was so talented, Um, but he was specifically very scientifically looking at do the same chemicals fireflies have, are they actually getting it, getting the building blocks from the milkweed? And we still don't really know that, although I know I put milkweed roots in with a bunch of larvae and they hollowed out the roots overnight. And they had other food in the container. I had put stuff that I knew they liked, cat food, scrambled eggs, and blueberries. They went right to the milkweed and they burrowed all the way through the root. So I thought that was pretty compelling of something. But pay attention and try to take pictures if your listeners see fireflies on any flowers particularly milkweed. We, we do find the soriaca, the common milkweed seems to be the most attractive to them. We have seen them on the pretty orange butterfly weed and all that, but they seem to like the soriaca the most. And um, of course that varies where you are in the country. We have records of it now from Texas up to Canada, Wyoming, all over the Southeast. I mean, it's happening everywhere. It wasn't because when I first started writing the paper, I thought, well, what if it's just here? Like, what if for some reason only our Tennessee ones do it? But uh, that very first year, I found records all over the place. And I saw it in Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia. You know, I saw it all around also. But it's fairly short-lived. They only come to the blooms when they're very fresh. And it is thought that possibly they only need to, need to eat once, particularly if they're getting chemical building blocks instead of just having some sweet nectar. But again, we don't know that for sure. Yeah. And that's really interesting too, because I know common milkweed, the Asclepia syriaca, mm-hmm. that one's the one that monarch caterpillars yes. prefer as well. And exactly. it goes back to those chemicals and it also spreads really rapidly by tubers yeah. and sends out all the shoots. That's why it's not a really good one for a small backyard garden where you want it to stay nice and neat and play nice with everybody else. Right. But if it has more of the chemicals in there mm-hmm. and the larvae are eating the roots as well, I mean, this all starts to cool? just raise pop- abilities and questions. <laughs> it's cool. And then one student up north, he really did look hard. I mean, he really did. And he just wasn't having much success. And I could tell he was doubting that I was telling the truth, even though I had data and everything else. But what I realized in that area where he was from, where we are in East Tennessee, we're at almost the southern range of Soriaca. And so when you have a patch, it's not like we have it everywhere. It's in discrete places. And the years I was doing the paper, I'd have, I, we have three grown sons and a husband. I'd get a call from mom. I saw one along I-40 at exit 386. There's a patch, you know, and I'd get in the car and drive out there and see if there were fireflies on it. And so I wondered if it helped me make the discovery that we don't have that much of it. And so the fireflies group more on the little we have where the young student I was working with up north, he had it everywhere, you know, any roadside, it was all over the place. So the fireflies weren't going to have to be as concentrated to get hold of it. And again, if it's a one-time deal, you have to hit the blooms right. They don't do it in the middle of the day. It has to be in the cool of the day at the beginning and the end. You know, there's sort of a trick to all of it. But to me, it's fascinating. And 
what it's opened up is how many people are sending me photographs now of other flowers with fireflies doing the exact same thing. And so I have a whole folder of photographs. And then international people are writing me and they are seeing it on some of their flowers and their things. So there's something going on that's more interesting than what we currently understand. Yeah. And you mentioning the fact of the milkweeds being more concentrated, I'm wondering if that's part of why it was easier for you to discover or notice, kind of makes me also wonder, okay, what's the role of these monarch gardens that everybody's putting in? Because sometimes there, I mean, it may be the only patch of milkweed around. And so are we going to start seeing it more there if we start looking as well? Oh, it's interesting. The first year I was so excited. I was having to drive a hundred miles round trip to check my patches. And I had one, one colony a mile from my house. So that one was handy. Well, it's now underneath a high school. It's gone. The entire Mm -hmm. habitat's gone. So my other best primary site was a hundred mile drive. So I ordered milkweed that year. I thought, wait a minute, (laughs) I'm going to plant some here so I don't have to go so far. And I found, I discovered a couple of things like you, and luckily we have land for it to kind of spread and it'll take over if it's happy. And then I also picked some pods and tried to plant a natural patch from wild milkweed. I don't know what it is because they look just the same, but the plants I bought are not as popular with insects, monarchs, or fireflies. They do come to them, but my one wild patch that did naturalize and take over, that's the popular one. So there must be some differences in the chemicals and the different things. I don't know, but the very first year. So I bought, you know, the little plants that are 12 inches tall and put them in in March or whatever. I had, I had monarchs the first year and we are not on a flyway. If you read my paper, I saw more fireflies on milkweed than I did monarchs in my two years of studies. We just, we have a few, we get all excited when we see a monarch, but we don't have like some places that have the flyways. And so the fact that they found my hand planted milkweed the very first year makes me, I wonder if the monarch vision is programmed. You know how those funny color blooms on milkweed is, you know, it's kind of mauve or I don't know what you call it, sort of purple, but not quite purple or it's nothing bright. The pinkish purple. Yeah. I'm wondering what the monarch sees from the air. I think they can either smell it or see it or all of the above. They somehow can find the plants really quickly. And I've just been fascinated seeing how many monarchs we're getting now when we had none before. Mm -hmm. And they are laying their eggs and doing their babies and all of that. And, And the fireflies are coming to it also. The fireflies also came the very first year, but I think they're kind of around. So that wasn't quite as amazing, but it's a lot of things for your listeners to look for. There's way more than monarchs like milkweed. And at night, I mean, make sure they go out. Oh, I was so fascinated because I had to rule out were a lot of fireflies eating milkweed at night, possibly. And I I was missing it. Well, the answer was no. Um, they, they're too busy flying around mating. But there's a whole different world on milkweed at night. Ah, there were so many cool things, moths, and I mean, there was everything. And it was like a different world. You saw totally different insects at night than you did during the day on the same milkweed plant. Unfortunately, that bunch is under the high school. So I lost all of that in one year. I was so glad I did that study. The next year it was gone. And I'm sad because I think of all those, it was a very rich area and so much insect life, but it's all concrete now in bricks. So do you know the ones that you bought, Mm. were they straight species or were they a cultivar? I tried to buy the straight, it was called Soriaca, Okay, but it was, I did buy it and I tried to go, you know, I'd have to look up where, but it was one of those that advertised themselves you know, wildflowers and all that, but there's clearly something different. And the actual bloom looks slightly different than the wild one. So probably it is a cultivar of some type, but it was considered that species. Yeah. But it works. I mean, it works. They're just not quite as popular as the wild ones. Yeah. There's been some research that was looking at cultivars Mm -hmm. and they actually did swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed. They didn't do syriaca common milkweed and the chemicals and stuff with that. I will send you that paper. Oh, I, I'd love that. Was that Argwal? Was it one of his? 
No, Adam Baker. Okay. Did it. Yes. It was, um, I, I find that all just fascinating. And the swamp milkweed, I saw that in Virginia, you know, the fireflies like that. And then Texas has some of their own species. So it's just, I guess I've seen the common milkweed more because that's what's around here. But there is not a milkweed plant I pass now that I don't look at <laughs> to see who's on it. It's like, okay, what's going on on this one? You know, it's one of my friends who I've horseback ridden with for years, about 10 years ago, she said, Lynn, I don't know. It's getting pretty weird to walk with you through the woods. She said, you can't walk past a tree without stopping and staring at it. And see, I was looking for the winter fireflies in the Paractamina. We were riding in late February. I said, well, I have to look. I mean, this is a great habitat here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. I, I've got a mile and a half loop trail that I like to walk over at Mammoth Cave National Park sometimes. And at certain times of the year, it will take me four to six hours oh, to walk that trail. Hey, I don't, I don't doubt it at all. That sounds like a great trail. That's such a beautiful area. That's, mm -hmm. um, I'd love to go back. We horse camped there for a week during firefly season. I was worthless. It was like, well, wait, I've got to do this. But uh, <laughs> just so pretty in the Green River and the woods and everything. Mm -hmm. That's, we have, yes. uh, we have symposiums world symposiums every three years. The, the world community of firefly people um, meet once every three years in a different hemisphere. Now the coronavirus has messed it up. We were supposed to go to Portugal last summer and they've just canceled it again this year. But, but um, one year it was in Malaysia at this forest institute. It was, it was it's such a cool place. Mm -hmm. Everything was exotic and different from what we were used to. And so they wanted all, there were, I think, 120 of us, all entomologists or super nature nerds, and they had a one-mile walk for us to take before they had a wonderful native barbecue dinner at the end of the one-mile walk, and they had factored that it would take us about 15 minutes, you know, to walk through the forest and get to the barbecue. <laughs> when an hour had passed, no one had moved more than 30 yards. Everyone was on their hands and knees and had their cameras out. And, you know, and, and the, the leader kept going, come, 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 come. <laughs> It's like, yeah, just a minute. And, and, you know, you never take a group of naturalists or entomologists out to a good spot and expect them to move very fast. No. <laughs> There's just too much to see. <laughs> and especially when you got lots of them that have different um, experiences, interests, and background, because then they can teach the others. And of course, as nature nerds, we all want to know everything. So it's, oh, oh yeah. you tell me that and I'll tell you this. And... <laughs> Exactly. It, it was just funny. And we all, you know, one, one guy says, just ignore him. You know, when they kept saying, come on, dinner is getting cold. Said, just ignore him. We won't be back here. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was a wonderful spot. Wonderful spot. <laughs> yes. I hadn't sent you any of my papers, but I wrote an article just for the general public that was published in September for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources on the new low country blue ghost. Mm -hmm. But you would like it because the discovery was made by a group of naturalists on an evening walk. Just what we're talking about, how you put a bunch of naturalists outside and they don't move far and they ran out of daylight because they were going to take a little short walk. And of course they kept seeing all this cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But I tell, I tell the story in my paper, what happened. But because of that, they were left in the dark with no flashlight. And because they were in the dark, they saw something that no one had ever reported before. And that's sort of the beauty of getting carried away with nature. You know, you stumble onto things that you're not expecting to find. <laughs> yeah, that's the way I saw the ghosts in the Smokies is yes. my then boyfriend, now husband, my brother and I had gone for a walk and mm -hmm. we'd be back long before supper time and it was going to get dark. Of course. And um, we didn't take a flashlight. No flashlight. Oh, God. We didn't take a flashlight. We yeah. had one bottle of water between us <laughs> and a handful of cookies. <laughs> Totally not like what you're supposed to do. <laughs> and yeah, we spent too much time at the beginning and ended up spending the night on the mountain, on the trail. Oh, oh really? What trail were you on? <laughs> do you remember? I forget which trail it was at this point, but yeah, it was on <laughs> one of the trails and we just, I mean, we realized we couldn't make it down. We were up on the top of the mountain at that point. Wow. So we kind of sat down and slept on the trail and <laughs> <laughs> watched the fireflies. <laughs> that is great. 
and 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 as you know from nature, the more you know, the more you see, which is why it takes somebody like you an hour to walk a hundred feet in a pretty forest trail because you know more, so you know more what to look at and look for, and then you get more excited over little tiny things that most people wouldn't even notice. But that's what's fun about it, you know, being interested in nature. Yes, exactly. So. We've talked a little bit about threats to the lightning bugs being Mm -hmm. compaction or pesticides, Mm -hmm. light pollution. Are there Mm -hmm. others? Those are kind of the biggies, the habitat destruction. Again, Mm -hmm. if you fill in a pond, everything that lived in that pond is gone. But the habitat destruction, the compaction, light pollution is one of the most fixable ones if we would just pay attention to that. And what it does, it just, the males can't find their females. if They can't compete with big lights. And so sometimes they'll just simply move farther away. But if their females are ones that can't fly, the females can't move away from the light. So that's an easy one. What I try to teach people is don't burn your outside lights unless you need them. You know, if you have a teenager coming in at midnight or you're having a garden party at night, that's fine. Burn those lights look like a battleship but a lot of people just turn on outside lights every single night and I don't really understand that and those lights travel a long way and disturb a lot of things that they'll never understand but that's a simple one that won't change your lifestyle at all also be very careful if you're trying to make your your lawn more firefly friendly have some wild spots I mow half as much as I used to and that's a great thing (laughs) to not have to mow as much And people I know have different situations with homeowner associations and stuff. But if you can get away with it, just every time you mow, you are crushing all sorts of things and mowing up things. So if you do it half as much, that makes sense that it will give those things time to come out of the the ground. And a water source is always nice, but that's kind of hard to artificially put in. But if you have one, leave the banks wild. Don't you know, manicure it all the way to the water. And then a lot of people don't realize that I saw in Lowe's a couple of years ago, this, it was like a lady in a dress and high heels sprinkling granules on her beautiful green lawn. And it was to kill fleas. And if you have dogs, you really don't want fleas. But this was this broadcast stuff. And it kills, I looked up the chemical, it kills everything. It it kills not just fleas, it kills every insect in the soil. But it looks so harmless. You just sprinkled it in this handy container and you would in one fell swoop kill every larva in your grass if you did that because they are a beetle. Mm -hmm. Because I read how many different things it killed, you know, and it was beetles and everything. Mm -hmm. And so be, be thoughtful when you use pesticides. And I know some people have to, but it does usually kill more than the thing you're wanting killed. And sometimes it totally upsets the balance where you'll end up with a worse problem in the end. So, you know, I don't want to go through and tell people they can't mow their grass and they can't use pesticides and all that, but just be aware that you are affecting things and even herbicides, because then that affects the plants, which might affect the microorganisms that feed on that plant in the soil. So the more wild places you can have, the better if you're a firefly and to keep your outside lighting. I mean, we're, I'm pretty good. I'm sort of a Nazi on outside lighting here. And we live out in the country. There's no reason to have a light. But we also don't have curtains around our house. So our light we use inside spreads out. And I never thought that much about that. It's like, well, we got plenty of dark woods all around us. But one year I was working with David Attenborough, the Life That Glows series, and we ended up coming here. We were going to go film in the Smokies. We had been up in Pennsylvania and then went to Ohio. And we ended up in Tennessee and we were going to film in the Smokies. But that particular year was just this amazing year. And there were so many different species around our house. And the sequences we were wanting was predation, spider predation and kleptoparasitism, where the fireflies fly into the webs and steal the prey of the spiders. It's so cool to see. And we have a lot of that happening around our house. So anyway, we ended up spending eight days here filming. We never made it to the Smokies. And my husband was out of town. And so it was a good time to do it. The film crew just moved in upstairs. 
and we keep really weird hours while we're filming, like you're up all night. And then you have a lot of work to do in the daytime before it all begins again. So anyway, it was just us doing our nerdy thing at my house. And so we kept all the lights off. You know, we never used lights. Once it got dark, there were no lights coming from our house. And I was astonished by how much the, we do have rich fireflies around our house, but they always kind of hung out in the woods, you know, a hundred yards away. Well, it was because of the lights on the house. And that one year, and it's the only time I've seen it, they were right, they were on the windows, they were in the grass and not just the yard bugs, this was all the species. They were spinning webs on the house, you know, catching things. And it was so amazing and made me kind of feel guilty. It's like, oh, we ought to put curtains up or something. but they moved in one season quite close because suddenly it was dark and friendly instead of glaring light that makes them go elsewhere. So little things do matter. And you took that exactly where I wanted it to go too, is what can we do as homeowners to make our yards more firefly friendly? Yeah. And I guess it would be important also to say and to kind of point out that we are talking fireflies are beetles. So if you're putting stuff out to kill the larva of the Japanese beetles, which I know many of us have yes. problems with. Right. You're also killing firefly larvae. Yeah, yeah, you have the potential to. Yeah. yeah, and so we don't think of that, but it's, we're all in this together. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. but you really can increase. I mean, I've had people who have actively tried to make their places more firefly friendly. And again, people have different situations. They're putting in subdivisions out our way. Oh, they're finishing a house every 36 hours right now in our oh, wow. previously rural valley. I mean, and it's been going at that rate for about four years now. And so some of my prime firefly habitat that I've used and done studies in the past now might have 400 homes with a fifth of an acre yards. And they're pretty well gone from there in a little tiny yard with lots of neighbors around. And those beautiful green lawns a lot of them have, they're going to have trouble having much of anything. But people that do have a little more space or an older yard, they can do quite a bit. Thanks. This has been extremely educational. I mean, I've really loved this. Hey, I'm expecting great things of you, Shannon. You're going to be sending me a picture of a firefly on a tree pretty soon. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. yeah, thanks. But is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap this up? No. Thank you. Just tell people to get out there. Oh, oh, I do. This is like I'm a cell phone Nazi and I'm as addicted to my phone as anyone out there. Do not look at your cell phone if you are trying to enjoy fireflies because it will blind you. It will ruin your night vision. And it's so tempting because you're sitting still for once and you'll want to just see if that email came through or that little text message. But you will ruin your night vision, particularly if you're beyond 40. Because the older you get, the slower your night vision readapts. And um, I see that so much. And if you're with other people, it's distracting to other people. So it's a, a time to kind of get used to not being addicted to your phone for a little while. Keep it in your pocket. And the same with flashlights. I don't want anybody to break their leg or fall in the dark. And you can, you can do that real easily. So what I suggest, if people are really going out firefly hunting, walk that area during the day first. Get familiar with it. If it's your yard, you already know what it's like. But if you're in an unfamiliar place, try to get there in the daylight and kind of scope out. And you'll begin, after you've done it a while, getting an eye for what would be a good place. Usually there's water nearby, nice mature forest or a nice open lawn or, you know, whatever, but have them go in the day and kind of pick a spot. And then when you walk in in the dark, if you don't just wait for darkness to fall, use a, the smallest thing you can get, a pen light, you know, something and only point it down to your feet with your hand shielding the escape light. And it's almost hard to find a little pin light now because they're all LED and really bright, but that helps not bother other people. It doesn't bother the fireflies, but you can kind of see your feet. If you're sort of young and if there's any moon, a lot of times, if you just totally dark adapt your eyes, you can actually see pretty well with no light. But my suggestion is try not to walk around and cover five miles. If you're looking for fireflies, just sit in that one spot in a lawn chair or something and see what flies past. I think you'll see a lot more and it takes, it will take up to seven minutes 
and even with young people for us to start seeing all the glowing lights. And so it's longer than you think. And seven minutes is actually a really long time when you're just sitting there. Younger people may do it in two or three minutes, four minutes, but the longer you don't have any sort of light, the more you will see. And so that's a real important thing. If you're turning your light off and on and don't carry a lantern with the 365 degrees of light, I mean, that just blinds everybody and you see nothing. I have had people stop me in Elkmont on a peak night, you know, where it's, it's so incredible. There are thousands of flash, you know, flashing all around me. Mm -hmm. And I have had people walk up to me holding a lantern and ask, where are the fireflies? because they truly cannot see them. They don't understand they are surrounded by them. They are blinding themselves. I also recommend carry a bright flashlight in your backpack. And it's for an emergency. If someone falls, you know, if, if something happens and I've had everything happen. So you do need access to a bright light if a bunch of you are gonna be out in the dark at night, but hopefully don't ever use it. Just use the tiniest little thing you can use to see your feet and you'll just see a whole lot more. It'll be more enjoyable. Oh yeah, I love going out at night yeah. without a flashlight and just looking because you do see yeah. so much. Oh yeah, it's it's another world, yeah. Unless you have people with good milkweed and then they do need a good light and <laughs> go to their milkweed patch just to see all the insects. It's not fireflies, you won't really see them, but I kept thinking of Africa. You know, the first time I was looking at milkweed at a peak time where the blooms were all, you could smell them and all that, mm -hmm. all the wildlife around that at night, it was just amazing. Yeah, but I mean, we could go on forever, but we probably should wrap this up. So just to let everybody know, I will have a link to Len's book in the show notes. Definitely go get it. I'll also put a link to that South Carolina lowland country ghost paper that she was talking about in there as well. Okay, good. And if anyone's on ResearchGate, a lot of my papers are, are there. Most of them you can find them online. Okay. But the South Carolina one's fine because it's, it's like four pages, a lot of pictures, but it tells the importance of naturalists and their observational skills are where first discoveries are made often. Yeah. So cool. Well, Shannon, good luck to you. All right. Thanks. Good luck to you too. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I can't express enough gratitude to Lynn for taking so much time to chat with us. She is so knowledgeable and so much fun to talk to that I could have kept talking to her forever, which is probably why I had to break this conversation into two episodes. I really do encourage everyone who wants to learn more about fireflies to get Lynn's book and check out some of her other papers. I have links to all of those in the show notes. As I said at the very beginning of our conversation, Lightning bugs have always held a special place in my heart, so much so that I sometimes take them for granted. They've just always been there, and so I assume they always will be. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. Like so many other organisms, fireflies do face many threats. The good news is that many of those threats are ones that we can do something about, especially the light pollution threat. I also really appreciated Lynn's balanced approach as she talked about the things that we can do to make our yards more firefly friendly. So often we hear, you have to do this, or you have to do that, and it can become very polarizing or make you feel guilty if you can't live up to whatever you are being told that you have to do. It's always refreshing to find someone else who recognizes that life is a balancing act. Even if we know the ideals that we might want to strive towards, none of us live in a perfect world. And often the best we can do is be aware and make the best choices that we can for that particular situation. And those choices can change as our situations change. So like Lynn said, keeping outside lights turned off most of the time can help reduce light pollution. But at the same time, Leaving a light on for a family member who is coming home late is also completely understandable. It's all about finding that right balance, and your balance may not be the same as mine or anyone else's, and that's okay. I had so much fun just geeking out about fireflies, listening to Lynn's stories, asking questions, and learning more about these fascinating insects. 
I hope you enjoyed our rambling conversation as much as I did and that you learned as much as I did too. I especially loved how the theme of just paying attention and making observations, sharing what you see, and then asking questions kept coming up as a major factor in so many discoveries. From identifying new species like the synchronized fireflies or the low country ghost, to better documenting the ranges of species like the pink flashers, or even just to recognizing previously overlooked behaviors like fireflies nectaring on milkweeds. There's just so much out there to learn and discover if we're willing to go out and keep our eyes open and pay attention. To me, that's really exciting, and it applies to just about everything in nature, not just fireflies. Before I wrap this up, I wanted to let you know that I also write a weekly backyard ecology blog. If you enjoy these podcast episodes, then you might also want to check out my blog. The easiest way to find my blog is to visit my website at www.backyardecology.net slash blog. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.